Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eliza. I'm the Customer Engagement Specialist here at Pandel, and welcome to this next Pandel Leadership Series of webinars. This installment is called Land Data from Start to Finish. We are delighted to have Anthony Ford with us today. Anthony is the president and co-founder of uslandgrid.com. Previously, Anthony worked for Geographics, White Star, Esri, and Premier Data, and we are delighted to have his expertise here to speak to us today. So, Anthony, I will welcome you and pass you off on the stage here. Thanks, Eliza. Much appreciated. Today, we're going to be talking about land data from start to finish. So, we're going to be talking about the history of land data and then some of the specifics when it comes to the specific layers. Before we get started, though, um, a little bit about US Land Grid. So we were founded in 2012. You can find us on the web at uslandgrid.com. Our primary focus is land grid data um, and land tax parcels. Uh, I think over the last few years, we've probably uh, done a little too much work on the digitization of hard copy maps. So we do do a lot of digitization work for a lot of the counties and parishes across the United States. But apart from that, we're most well known for our pre-processed on-demand uh, data that comes in multiple formats. So a quick intro about me, and I think Eliza covered it uh, pretty well. I'm the founder of US Land Grid, the VP of Sales. I have about 20 years experience in GIS and land mapping. Most of that has come from the surface and subsurface mapping side of things. So um, I have a fair bit of years in the oil and gas industry and the energy side of, of the business. When it comes to US Land Grid, I'm the head of sales and product management. And I'm uh, very proud to say that I'm the, the head rugby coach at the Colorado School of Mines. So today we're going to cover land data of the United States. So it is US centric when it comes to US Land Grid. And we're going to be covering the public land survey system, which covers most of the states. So all the states minus the original 13 colonies um, and minus Texas. Then we're going to be talking about the Texas land grid, uh, the history behind that, how Spain and Mexico play a big part in that land grid. And then we're going to be talking about land parcels or tax parcels across the continental United States. So if we jump straight into the public land survey system, uh, the land grid that was pushed or created by Thomas Jefferson, um, essentially, it was created in order to populate the Western United States, and it started with meridians. So you'll find that the first meridian is in Ohio, and uh, Ohio is an interesting piece of land when it comes to land grid and the public land survey system, because once again, that's where it started with the first meridian. But it was also the place where they didn't perfect surveying. So you, I think you'll find that there's seven meridians in Ohio. And the reason being is they realized they stuffed it up. So they did the first meridian, they started surveying like, oh my God, we haven't really figured this process out the way we wanted to. So they created a second starting point and they started surveying more of Ohio. And once again, they realized they hadn't perfected the art. So it took them about seven meridians in Ohio uh, to get the art of surveying right and, and, and done. Uh, but as you move west and across the United States, you'll notice that there's a lot less meridians and much larger pieces of land associated to that starting point, that meridian. The original source of the land grid that we see today or that we use today, the digitized land grid, is sourced or digitized from the USGS 1 to 24K topos. So the United States Geological Survey topos. Now, what that means is those topos have an accuracy of plus or minus 40 feet which means your land grid has an accuracy in the PLSS states of plus or minus 40 feet. The good thing about the topos and the land grid being on the topos, you can always bring the topo map um, underneath your land grid if you do see a data bust or if you do see some land grid that you're not sure of. A great way to check the um, integrity of your land grid is to bring in a topo map and have a look how it matches up to that topo map. In the public land survey system states, so um, most of the states, once again, in the United States, you basically got four main layers that you need to accurately auto map or map to your land grid. So you've got your sections, you've got your townships, you've got your lots, and you've got your quarters. Um, if we look at the sections, I call them the content king of the 
public land survey system. And the reason I do is it's really the basis for um, the PLSS land grid. It's where the surveys really, really do um, base their soul from, I guess. It's also content king because that's where most of the legal descriptions that you guys deal with are referring to. They're referring to section corners or north halves of the south quarter and so on. They could be footage calls or quarter calls, but they are obviously referring to the sections in the land grid. You've got, um, in most cases, and I say most cases because it does depend on, on boundaries and, um, and things ending, but in most cases, there's 36 sections that make up a township. Each section is approximately 640 40 acres or one square mile. And the reason I say approximately is they're never going to be perfect. And the reason being is it goes back to the Ohio um, real life analogy of how they did the surveying. You know, as they moved west and as these surveyors moved west, all sorts of things played into how accurate their surveys were. I mean, in many cases, these guys and girls were um, out in the middle of nowhere by themselves. Um, in some cases, uh, landowners would try and influence them. Um, but you can imagine there's going to be variances just based on the fact that it's a human doing those surveys all the way back in the, in the mid-1800s. Sections uh, within a township generally wrap around in an S shape or a cow plow. And so what you'll find is section number one will be in that top right-hand corner going from right to left to section six, and then down to section seven, and left to right, all the way to section 12 and so on. In our land grid, um, you'll find that the section ID is unique. You won't find two section IDs anywhere in the country that are duplicates. Um, and the same principles go for when you're comparing or combining sections with townships and counties. Obviously, they should be unique. If we look at townships, so obviously there's 36 square miles in a township or 36 sections. The range number for a township identifies how many townships a property is to the east or west of that starting point, or in other words, the meridian, uh, which is the starting point for, for any of the PLSS land grid. And the township number identifies how many townships the property is to the north or south of that starting point. Now, I know the image on the map is, uh, is hard to read, but it actually, in the middle there, you can kind of see township five north, range two east. So what that means is uh, the township we're looking at is um, five townships to the north and two townships to the east of that starting point, that meridian. All right, moving on to lots. So lots obviously are a very important part of auto mapping and mapping leases. Lots are referred to quite often when we talk about legal descriptions. Lots are a sub part of a section. They're not an aliquot part. They can be irregular or regular. Um, and what that means is you will find lots looking very consistent in shape. But then again, if uh, you come across lots along river boundaries ever, you will see lots that look like shattered glass and you'll even see duplicates of the same lot in the same section, which uh, can create problems for auto mapping, as you can imagine. But the acreage for lots because of this does vary. Um, and once again, um, you will see them referred to in legal descriptions. Lots are usually identified by a number, for example, lot number three. So quarters um, basically are a section divided into four quarters. Um, each quarter is generally 160 acres. Obviously, it's a derivative of the section, so it does depend on the acreage of that original section. And when we're dealing with quarters, um, they're obviously labelled with a quadrant direction. So you'll find the northeast quarter, uh, for example, or the northwest quarter and so on. Quarters are very important, once again, when it comes to depth in a land grid, uh, when it comes to mapping your leases. Um, most legal descriptions, or a lot of legal descriptions, I should say, do refer to, to quarters uh, when it comes to mapping that lease or that plot of land. Okay, I'm going to mention fractional townships only because it's interesting. I think it's pretty rare you're going to come across fractional townships, but they do occur. Um, an example is in Nevada, where you will see fractional townships either be a half, a quarter, or even three quarters in one case. Um, more a point of interest. I don't think you'll you'll come across it very often, if at all. 
but fractions can occur um, in townships when they're prematurely ended by a boundary, um, like a state boundary, for example. Okay, so that was the very quick um, and, and maybe in some cases too detailed rundown of the public land survey system. We're going to jump into Texas right now and, and talk about the Texas land grid. So as a quick overview, the Texas land grid is um, the land grid we use today. The original creator was the General Land Office. The Railroad Commission updates the land grid based on permits from commercial companies. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, historically, it's been oil and gas operators. Land grants have an associated abstract number. And so each land grant also has an abstract and an associated survey attached to it. Each um, and every other survey in West Texas, essentially, was designated as rail, railroad land or public school land. And we'll talk about this later, but it is um, an important point, especially when we're talking about commercial interests and operating in those areas. And lastly, talking about West Texas again, in that area of um, university lands, public school lands and railroad reservations, you will find a more standardized land grid, much like you would have found in the public land survey system. So you will find sections with 640 acre plots of land. Um, and that's relevant because you will find some of, well, some of our customers auto map to those sections in Texas, which makes life a little bit easier. But before we get into the nitty gritty and the, the, the layers um, when it comes to land grid in Texas, I think it's important to understand the history behind the Texas land grid. So Spain claimed the land that is now Texas in 1519. Um, the land grid that we use today does date back to those Spanish settlements and, and missions and presidios that existed back then. Spain issued leagues and labors. Um, they measured units in a thing called a barras, which was 33 and a third inches and was later adopted by the state of Texas as its official land measure. Um, and in Texas today, the largest concentration of Spanish land grants that you're going to find are going to be in southwest Texas. So if we take a little bit of a sidestep and talk about leagues and the bores, you will not find leagues and the bores in our land grid. It's not used today, but it is worth mentioning. You may come across some old legal descriptions, and I'm sure all of you have in, in, in one case or another, come across a legal description that refers to a league or a labor. So leagues um, were large parcels of land um, granted by the Spanish for grazing purposes. They were generally 4,500 acres. While they also granted a league, they granted a labor which was approximately 180 acres and was more for farming, generally had access to, to water or to a river, um, but had water access. So we'll talk more about leagues and the boards a little bit later, but I did want to introduce that because um, it does come up in later slides. So Mexico claimed independence of what is now Texas in 1821 from the Spanish. They too welcomed foreign settlers. Um, Stephen F. Austin is probably one of the most famous and successful empresarios that, that I could find. He was big on cadastral surveying. He was big on populating the land, especially from, um, from the Americas, having people migrate to this land and populate this land. Some of the um, Mexican period influences that we still see today, uh, for example, is the Homestead Act, uh, which prevents seizure of a home as payment for debts. Um, and this is actually an example of one of those um, one of those titles. I think I, I don't I don't see the date on there, but I'm I'm assuming it's probably well it is it's 1837, so just after the GLO was founded. Okay, so once again, Mexican law welcomed uh, empresarios, fought and settlers. They really wanted to um, make the land economic, which was honestly tough to do in the Spanish and Mexican um, days. Each settler would receive one league and one labor, and uh, rich settlers could possess up to 11 leagues and 11 labors. I think that image is somewhat interesting um, on that slide as well. It shows you the land titles issued by Stephen F. Austin's colony. Um, and as you can see, it's uh, huge, huge swaths of land. And was the start of what we're about to talk about. So. In 1836, the Republic of Texas was formed, and in 1837, the General Land Office opened. 
At the time, if you were living in Texas before 1836, up until the formation of the Republic, every head of the household living in Texas at that time received one league in labor. So quite a large piece of land. Vacant land became the property of the state. Land was surveyed by the actual grantee and then approved or disapproved by the general land office. Um, and an interesting um, note was to help populate the land, they introduced the Bounty Act, which allowed for 640 acres for soldiers who were migrating to Texas, um, which later increased to 800 acres. Interestingly enough, if you weren't a soldier at the time and you migrated to Texas after the Republic was formed, generally you were, you were granted 80 acres. So you can see the apportionment of land um, really declined from leagues um, all the way down to 80 acres. So some interesting stats about the Republic of Texas when it was founded. So you had 6.4 million acres were granted to soldiers. That ended up being, I think, about 6,000 soldiers or about 5,700 soldiers. 35 million acres were apportioned to railroad companies. 52 million acres went to university lands and uh, 22 million acres remained in the public domain, um, like state parks and things like that. So let's talk about university lands. This is um, an area of Texas a lot of people don't generally know a lot about, but as we uh, mentioned earlier, university lands date back essentially to the creation of the General Land Office back in 1837. Um, in 1949, the authority of university lands passed from the state to the University of Texas. And even today, university land revenues are exclusively for the benefit of uh, the universities in Texas. With that in mind, we have 2.1 million acres of university lands in 19 counties in West Texas today. They're large continuous blocks of acreage with clean titles and one landowner. Um, so they're advantageous blocks of land, usually for commercial interest. So some brief Texas land facts before we delve into the Texas land grid layers. The General Land Office was the original creator. Um, abstracts are assigned or were assigned by the GLO as unique identifiers. And every land grant has an abstract and number associated to it. The Railroad Commission, on the other hand, updates the original land grid based on permits submitted by commercial, commercial corporations in most cases. Adjustments are made if the surveys don't match. Adjustments are made if legal decisions have been made in the courts. And that's where you find the Railroad Commission updates are quite useful when it comes to current land grid. So Texas land layers. So we talked about the public land survey system and the main layers being the sections of the townships, the uh, lots and the quarters. In Texas, the main layers tend to be abstracts, surveys, blocks, sections and townships. You do have the junior surveys um, and the lots, tracts and subdivisions that date back to the early, early, early days, um, back to the formation of Texas. If you look at that land, um, sorry, that piece of land or that image, um, on the slide there, it goes back to um, the land grants and what I was saying. So I think, well, not I think, but prior to 1938, that um, yellow box represents a um, league, approximately 4,500 acres. So if you were living in Texas before the formation of the state, that's how much land um, at a minimum you would have gotten because you would have also got a labor as well. Um, if you arrived after, 19, after 1838 uh, and you were not a soldier, you were literally limited to that 80 acres um, in that red box there. Uh, but anyways, it's interesting because uh, uh, the league that you see there, that yellow box, actually pretty much represents the city of Austin, um, so a large piece of land. Okay, so let's get into the details of each layer. Um, so like sections in the PLSS states, abstracts are king in Texas. So abstracts are the original surveys and they contain the information abstracted from the land grant files pertaining to these surveys. They're specific to each county, which means that you can have an abstract number one in one county, and obviously you can have an abstract number one in another county. Information in our land data includes things such as the abstract number, the grantee or survey name, the section, if it falls within a section, the block, county and district. 
Surveys for each county are listed in numerical order by abstract number. And if you ever come across um, abstract question mark, for example, this is a legally questionable abstract. It's an undetermined land title. It means it's worth going back and looking at the land title for that piece of land. Um, I would argue that it's a data bust and it's also something that the Railroad Commission has not made a de determination on. You will also see um, sometimes abstracts fall on top of each other. Once again, I would consider that a land bust, but it does require going back and looking at land title to decipher what's really going on. Um, you will find abstract number survey and county are uh, unique to each other, so they don't exist um, twice ever, um, which is good from an auto mapping perspective or a good, a good point to note. And duplicate abstract numbers are once again cannot occur, obviously, in the same county. If we jump straight into surveys, these are the original grantee as listed by the GLO when it comes to the land title. They're directly related to abstracts. And honestly, they're probably the closest reference that we have today to the Spanish leagues and the Boers, or at least the Spanish Spanish leagues. In our land grid, you'll find um, it in a separate layer, but also under attribute value of survey name. Surveys can have overlaps as well. So subsurveys. Subsurveys are usually derivatives of the original survey. You tend to find subsurveys occur when a family, um, you know deeds the land to 16 different relatives. Um, so you have those sub grantees, you know, essentially the land has been sold and split for some reason. Uh, but once again, um, sub surveys directly relate to abstracts. Obviously they directly re relate to sub surveys. Attribute value in um, our land grid, it is a separate layer once again, but the attribute value you're looking for is sub survey name and they can have overlaps as well. So if we look at blocks, blocks basically describe a group of surveys. They're numbered or lettered. You're gonna find most of the blocks, as you can see from the image, are found in West Texas or the West half of Texas. Um, separate layer, obviously, once again, like all our land grid layers, but with an attribute value of block label, and uh, they can overlap other blocks. So moving on, Texas sections. So this is the, probably the closest thing we have to the public land survey system in Texas. In West Texas, you tend to find that sections are um, like sections in the PLSS, 640 acres. Um, this is a direct move away from the Spanish and Mexican land system that you find uh, in the majority of Texas. It tends to follow the public land survey system. And we have quite a few of our customers auto mapping um, to sections in, in West Texas. Um, without belating the issue too much, um, there's 36 million acres of land in West Texas that tend to be associated with sections. And um, once again, in a lot of cases, university lands. So you do tend to find um, not only from a mapping perspective, but also from a commercial perspective, um, it's a good area of land to be working from um, and a lot easier than other parts of Texas in some cases. So I will talk about lots and tracks real briefly. Lots and tracks do get quite complex. We're talking about the end of the, the, the Mexican um, era when it comes to Texas and the start of the GLO, but it does go back to those original land grants. Um, lots uh, generally are 640 acre tracks. Um, however, they do vary in size. Um, so it's definitely not a hard, hard truth that they're going to average 640 acres. They do vary in Texas. Um, tracks, on the other hand, do tend to be smaller, but they vary even more. They can be 320 acres in some cases, all the way down to 80 acres. Um, and I think if you find the 80 acre tracks, you, you might find that they're, they tie into the original uh, migration uh, when the GLO opened up in 1837. Okay, so I know that's a lot when it comes to land grid, but essentially, what we just talked about was history and specifics of layers when it comes to land grid in the public land survey states. So all the states outside of Texas and those original 13 colonies. And then we talked about Texas and the uniqueness of Texas and why Mexico and Spain obviously play a big role when it comes to the Texas land grid. So the big question is, how do we map those original 13 colonies? I mean, when Thomas Jefferson decided to survey 
the Western United States, starting in Ohio, there was no need to survey from a land grid perspective those 13 colonies because they're already populated. You know, they're really trying to push population growth out west. So there are two stable sources of um, land data that most of our customers use in um, places like New York, um, Pennsylvania, and places like that. They use the municipal boundaries and they use the land parcel or tax parcel data. It's definitely a different way to manage land from a PLSS and uh, a Texas perspective, but it doesn't stop you from auto mapping to parcel IDs. Um, and in many um, cases, it, it could be argued it's a more effective way to map um, depending on what your workflow is and um, the type of land that you're managing, such as the size of that land. So let's talk about land parcels. Let's talk about these tax parcels that most, of, most folks are using as land grid in those eastern states. To be fair, um, I had to give a brief history of tax parcels because we did the same for uh, Thomas Jefferson's land grid and then uh, Spain, Mexico and the GLO's land grid. Uh, but tax parcels date all the way back to ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt tax land, among other things. Athens financed their wars through high property taxes and the Romans introduced a valuation and incentive system. Um, so what the Romans did, they would send somebody out, um, they'd go ahead and uh, evaluate your land, um, a building that was on your property if you're a farmer, and then they would um, give you a quota if you're a farmer, for example. And if you exceeded that quota, they actually reduced your taxes. So there was a true tax and incentive system for, um, I guess, overproduction or um, exceeding your quota. Interestingly enough, uh, William the Conqueror uh, was the first to keep cadastral records with his tax roll, so with his tax book. And I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, but I think it's called a Domesday book. And um, the picture you see there is an example of um, his cadastral records from his Domesday book. So it's kind of interesting. So if we look at early United States and tax parcel history, uh, Boston town records show that in 1676, they kept a fairly detailed tax roll. So they kept details of each taxpayer, the acres of land, even the value of the houses of that, uh, on that land um, and an assessment of a personal estate. Um, interestingly enough, once again, um, in Boston up until 1733, the sheriff was the tax assessor and collector um, and he happened to be doing that for, for the church. They did keep very, very, very detailed maps um, numbered, but as you can see from the example, and it's a real life example, um, they did keep quite detailed cadastral maps when it came to their tax information. Some more interesting points, I guess. Uh, Wyatt Earp was born both a law enforcement officer and a tax collector for the city of Tombstone. Um, and tax, taxes on land were much more prominent leading up until 1913 when the 16th Amendment was passed, which allowed for direct taxes um, and income taxes. So at that time, property taxes started to reduce and income taxes started to play a much, much bigger role. But that being said, even Benjamin Franklin, and, and I don't know the dates on Benjamin Franklin, but it was definitely be before 1913. I'm, I'm pretty sure that even he said, but in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. So ironically, he was talking about property taxes when he was talking about that. And he was probably talking about the English, I'm sure. So uh, I <laughs> don't want to allude to that either. So let's have a look at a more detailed picture of uh, actual land parcels. So land parcels generally fall on one layer. It's the land ownership and polygon information for each and every parcel of land in the United States. So what that means is your house, whether you rent or own, is on a parcel of land. We've got that mapped. And it not only tells us who owns that land, but it tells us who's renting that land. It tells us how big the land is. It tells us what the purpose of the land is. It tells us the legal description of the land. Um, so it's got all sorts of incredibly useful information for many different uses, whether you're a right-of-way company, whether you're an exploration company, um, you know, whether you're trying to contact a property owner or whether you're actually just trying to cross-check the land grid and make sure you're drilling a well in the right section. Um, there's probably a thousand different uses, as, uses for uh, tax parcels. Um, the tax parcels are sourced from the individual county and parish assessors. 
So each county and each parish manages their own tax roll. And we collect that information from them, put it in a map and um, a consistent format. So we put it into a standardized data model, no matter where you are in the country. So all the data is standardized. If you are working on a county or a parish on um, one side of the country and then move to the other side, the data model and everything remains the same. So it's easy to implement, and easy to work with. Most counties update, um, and so do we, update their tax roll twice per year. And so you do find updates for um, tax data much more frequent than you will find for, for land grid. I will note, because I didn't say it earlier, Texas Land Grid does update quarterly. And you'll generally find it's anywhere from, you know, um, 20 or 30 changes all the way up to a couple of hundred changes. So updating your Texas Land Grid um, is fairly important. So moving on with tax parcels, uh, I think I already mentioned this, but it's a great way to contact property owners or get the information that you need in order to contact property owners. It's a great way to get physical addresses. Uh, once again, it's a great way of cross-checking planned infrastructure. You will find that tax parcel data generally, and I'm going to say generally because, once again, it is collected from the individual counties, but generally is tied a lot more closer to modern-day survey data. So you will generally find that tax parcel data is going to be more accurate than the plus or minus 40 feet accuracy you're getting on your land grid. So cross-checking planned infrastructure, especially when that planned infrastructure is basing the footage calls off section corners, uh, cross-checking that planned infrastructure with tax parcels can be, can be really useful and, and in some cases have saved some of our customers huge amounts of money. Um, tax parcel descriptions uh, are based off the land grid, so they actually are based off section corners, but much more so based off surveyed section corners than, than the original uh, public land survey system that we use today. It also has other useful information such as market value, zone, land use, all that sort of good stuff. The image I've actually got on the screen is just an example. Uh, the, top, the top picture shows uh, land grid. The bottom picture shows land grid with tax parcels. So really all I'm trying to show there is some of the depth that you get if you do combine the land group with the tax parcels. And once again, when it comes to planning or contacting property owners, just as two examples of many, uh, tax parcels can be, can be really useful. So um, that's it for me. Uh, I, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions um, or if there's anything that I didn't talk about that, that maybe somebody would like me to cover. But uh, Eliza, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Sure. Sounds good. Thank you, Anthony. That was a lot of very useful information. Um, I really enjoyed that. Let's dive on into some questions, starting with what is an aliquot? So for the purposes of today's uh, presentation, really, when we're talking about aliquots, we were just talking about quarters. Um, and they're just, uh, what do you call it, a rational part of a section in that case. And so an aliquot is something that's split up into even parts. Is, is how I would define an aliquot. Thank you. Uh, this next one, could you remind us quickly what GLO stands for? The General Land Office is what the GLO stands for. And the General Land Office is probably the first place I would go to if I do see a data bust or if I see an abstract overlapping where I want to go ahead and check the land grant um, and, and see if I can do some research information of why this data bust is occurring. Why are Kentucky and Tennessee not covered by PLSS and what land grid do they use? Great question. And I should have covered that. So thanks for bringing that up. So Kentucky and Tennessee use Carter quads and um, we do provide Carter, quad, Carter quads as part of our um, as part of our land grid. It comes standard. I don't like the land grid very much, that Carter quad system in Kentucky and Tennessee, because I see it more as a protracted land grid. And what I mean by that is I don't really understand that there's a real source behind it. Whereas in the PLSS states, you've got you've got the um, the USGS 1 to 24K topos that you know it's been digitized to. In Kentucky and Tennessee, Carter quads, I think, are really, really suspect. Um, but that's the language that exists there. I would advise to use tax parcels if you are going to be mapping effectively in those two states. Do all Texas GLO lands dedicated to public universities go to the University of Texas or allocate amongst all the public 
uh, Texas public universities. My understanding is they're managed by the University of Texas, but they are actually allocated to all the public universities in Texas. Okay, another one for you. This is great. We've got some good questions coming in. How do permitted locations impact a land grant? It's a good question because unlike the PLSS states where the land, grid, the land grid is very, very, very defined because it's very mathematical, right? Um, as we defined um, how they did the survey with a section being 640 acres and so on, it was very defined. Unfortunately, in Texas, because you've got a mix of land grids that have essentially you know, rolled into one, which is the land grid we use today, you do have some contested areas, okay? And so um, if I'm thinking about the original question here, if you, if you do find that um, you've got an overlapping abstract or even um, a sliver of land, you know, it's still being interpreted, interpreted in some cases. And, and a lot of the land grid changes that you see in Texas actually come from the courts. So it's literally been decided in the courts in the last few months. It's then been submitted to the Railroad Commission and the Railroad Commission has made the update based on a court ruling. But if you do come across areas where there are some overlaps or there are some slivers, it generally means that it's time to go ahead and look up the land grant and, and start to look at what the data bust is and see if you can decipher what's really going on. But you will find that there are contested areas in Texas. These permitted locations will get submitted and if they're contested, they will then go to the courts and get decided. If they're not contested, then the, um, then the Railroad Commission will go ahead and accept the permit. And if there's a change that needs to be made to the land grid based on that permit, they'll actually make that change because those permits are obviously land surveys. And so they do hold weight with the Railroad Commission. The next question that popped in was that the PLSS grid in Alaska appears to be particularly regular and clean compared to the rest of America. Is there some interesting history related to that? You know, I don't know. And it's an interesting point. It is it is clean. And you would think it would be quite complex because of all the different islands along the way. Well, not along the way, but out of the way. Um, I don't know the history behind it, but obviously we do provide um, land grid for Alaska. And it is very true. It is clean. Maybe the reason it's so clean, and this is more an educated guess than anything else, it was probably the last or one of the last states to be surveyed. Mm -hmm. So chances are they... Um, they, they did a good job um, and going they had back, practice at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't they didn't do what they did in Ohio, put it that way. Um, OK, next question is of the uh, original league and labors in Texas, how many still exist in, like the way they were created originally? You know, it, it's such a loaded question. So and I, I say that because I'm going to say none. Um, from a legal perspective, they don't exist. I mean, I, I don't think if you went to the Railroad Commission or you went to the Texas courts referring to a labor that you might actually um, win the case. Um, I do think it gives history to the land, though, and it does start to give you more context as to maybe what happened to that land. Um, so they are relevant. You will find, I guess, if you're dealing with some really, really, really old maps, they will refer to leagues and labors in some cases. Um, and that's where I think it gets challenging, right? Because that land doesn't officially exist today, but you still need to map it. So if you've got a legal description that refers to this league and this labor, and then maybe some footage calls from the old oak tree, how do you map it? Um, and I think the best way to answer that is when it comes to our land grid, you do have the lots, the tracks and the subdivisions, and you do obviously have the original surveys. Um, I would start there. But once again, I would try if, if it became too difficult to map, I, I would have to go back to those original land grants or those land titles and try and decipher it, hoping that they refer to that original legal or ball. I think we've gone through all the questions that people have submitted. Those were some really good ones. Um, it was really a pleasure to have you online with us today, Anthony. That was a lot of fantastic information, and I know our audience enjoyed it as well. So thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. And thank, thank you, you to everybody who joined us online today. We hope you'll join us again at a future webinar. But it's great to see everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate your time. Bye. Bye.